My friends on the dais, uh, lady and gentlemen, uh, I'd say about uh, uh, 10 years ago, uh, in, in one of our old plants, uh, we, uh, we made a change of a contractor. Uh, the workers were not happy with uh, that move that we did, and they went on strike. Uh, this strike lasted for about uh, 30 days' time. Uh, as you all know, that uh, gate meetings were held outside of our factory. A uh, lot of negativity was felt at that point of time. After 30 days, management gave in and we replaced our contractor and production resumed. It was a period of mistrust. At that time, everything was negotiated. So at that time, if you had to produce five more tires, you had to look at giving some more money to the workers in the plant. A lot of our bandwidth was getting utilized in non-value added activities. And overall, morale was relatively weak. At that time, profit was the key motive of the company. Every morning, the top management would get two main factory metrics, which is what is the volume that was produced, and the second was conversion cost. Most of our initiatives, therefore, was around cost cutting. Even recruitment, uh, we would recruit men with who weighed 80 kgs plus at our factories because there was a fair amount of physical movement of tires that had to be done. Despite our focus on cost cutting, on profit, I'd say profits were relatively volatile and generally on the lower side. Around that same time, we uh, visited uh, Toyota as part of a training program. The entire top management went there. And uh, we understood and saw a lot about the famous Toyota production system. We learned about the concept of Kaizen's, continuous improvement, problem solving, Pokayo case, et cetera. We realized we needed to change the way we work. So we had an internal management workshop with a TQM guru. And we did a self-diagnosis on where do we stand on customer centricity, on systems and process-based working, on continuous improvement, et cetera. And we gave ourselves a score of about 1.5 on four marks. We then decided to go ahead with TQM implementation. And TQM, or total quality management, is largely based on uh, certain philosophies of customer centricity, long-term thinking, decision-making based on data and facts, system process-based working, et cetera. So one of the first things that we did was work on developing trust with our workers on the shop floor. We invested in them. We improved the infrastructure and the place where they worked. We made sure that we invested in themselves making, uh, feeling good about themselves at home. Many of them had bad habits. They would be addicted to alcohol, etc. So we worked on generally improving their life. Even at work, they had a lot of physical stress. As I shared with you, we only recruited men of a certain weight. So there was a lot of physical movement of tires, etc. that they had to do. So we looked at reducing about 1,000 plus muris, or the stresses that they face at work. And we in turn didn't ask for anything in return. And that, over time, started to build uh, some trust in them. Over three, four years, five years' time, I'd say the relationship got better. We were able to introduce practices such as autonomous maintenance, plan maintenance, 5S, et cetera, in the factory. We also shifted our focus at that time from uh, volume and cost only to the entire array of metrics of PQC, DSM, you know, safety, delivery, morale, et cetera. Cost, which used to be the top focus, was replaced by delivery to customer, quality of product, et cetera. And over time, we looked at in introducing uh, QIPs, which we call as complex problem-solving methodologies, Kaizen's, quality circles, et cetera. Breakdowns came down, quality improved, 
inventories and other wastages came down quite well. Today, workers are like family for us and we are jointly working for the betterment of the company. In our new factories, we are now looking at 40% plus women workers in our factories and working towards a self-managed team based of working where they don't even have supervisors over them. In 10 years, we've seen about a 90% improvement in our key parameters. We are not talking about the 10, 20% that we see regularly, but a 90% improvement in a lot of key parameters. And this is a largely tectonic shift. We now have a board outside all of our plants which says the bitterness of poor quality remains long after the sweetness of low price is forgotten. Yeah, so the bitterness of poor quality remains long after the sweetness of low price is forgotten. I'd say this is not a change which only CH saw. I think this was something which happened across industries, not only in the auto space, but across industries in the 90s, in the 2000s. Uh, factories have moved towards a more lean, higher way of working. I think we are now in a period where we will see the next tectonic shift in the manufacturing industry. And that's happening because of large two changes that are happening. I'd say customers are becoming much more demanding. Our OEMs are expecting just-in-time deliveries in exact quantities with zero defects. Customers want higher safety, more comfort, longer life, and all of that at a lower price. Product variety has increased so much more substantially. You look at the number of automobiles that are getting released every year. Each of those need different kinds of tires. And at the same time, we still have people using the Fiat of the 1980s. So you can't even stop producing those tires. So we have to make tires from Fiat to the newest CSUVs that are coming out in the industry today. All of these are substantially increasing the complexities in manufacturing. They're leading to smaller production cycles, tighter quality norms, and all of this again without any increase in costs. The other big change that we uh, saw our previous speakers talking about is on technology, where we're seeing devices getting a lot more connected. Costs of sensors have gone down substantially. Cloud computing is picking up. We're talking about so much more additional data getting collected. Devices are becoming more intelligent, which are taking decisions on their own which we now call artificial intelligence. The cost of 3D printing is coming down. There's advancement in computer vision technologies such as AR, augmented reality, and virtual reality. There's also advancement in simulation and digital twin technologies. And the auto industry is going through its own big change even outside of manufacturing. You may have all heard of ACES or CASE acronym, which is Autonomous Driving, Connected Vehicle, Electric Vehicle, and Shared Mobility. All these four are having dramatically big changes to the entire industry and therefore the entire value chain. So how will a plant of the future look? Large greenfield plants, lights out, no people in the factory, Lots of screens, lots of robots talking to each other. I don't think so. I think it's going to be a lot more brownfield. I think it's going to be a lot of building that will happen on existing machines. Just to give you a few examples of the changes that we are seeing happening and which will happen, one is on predictive maintenance. We have, or we will have sensors on machines as prices come down. They create signals, and IoT generally connects them to a data lake, which then gives out far more intelligence than a human brain can process. We will know in advance before a machine fails that which machine is likely to fail. Spare parts of this machine will be ordered automatically for the maintenance engineer. The maintenance engineer will come in wearing an AR headset, which will have all the instructions on how to do the job. Now with that, you can imagine 
how much inventories will come down. Imagine the improvement in accuracy or the mistakes that a maintenance engineer can make and how much less training he will need because all the data will be available while he is doing the job. Another example will be on digital performance management. All performance dashboards will be fed by sensors. There'll be no discussion on quality of data. There'll be no discussion at the end of the month that we have to wait for the data to come out because the data will be real time. It's likely that this data will be available on a handheld, maybe on your mobile phone or on, on an iPad kind of device. And you can drill down on your fingertips. Now this will make problem solving far easier and again reduce a lot of non-value added time. A third example is on digital SOPs. You may remember having undergone a lot of training on SOPs, a lot of which many of us don't remember. Now imagine if SOPs become digital. It's like moving from physical maps to Google Maps. It's something you cannot even imagine that ex we, we worked on physical maps in the past. It will improve productivity so much more. You can make changes to SOPs immediately. And again, you don't have to keep referring back and forth from physical manuals uh, to something which will be digitally available on a live basis. 3D printing will also lead to radical customization and personalization. Prototyping and product development will come down to a much, much faster pace. And we will also see personalization just going up to the next level. So these are just some examples of changes that we will see in the factory. As Mr. Bali also shared, that there will be changes to business models. Just to give you some examples, uh, today how do we decide on decisions of factories? We will look at being closer to the raw material source, maybe low cost countries like India or China, etc. But maybe in the future, will we look at setting up factories if the costs come down substantially next to innovation centers or being closer to our customers? Can there be a platform for underutilized production? So you can rent underutilized production by the hour because data may be available uh, for production data or unutilized bays uh, across the world from all plants. And we will shift from buying and selling hardware to selling services. So maybe we will be buying uh, VMI machines by the hour and paying you for uh, at a per tire production rather than uh, a lot on one machine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but I think let's stick to the factory itself. I think uh, uh, we, we're seeing that uh, all management uh, boardrooms are now talking about digital and industry 4.0. And I think there are some things that we have learned from our mistakes, some learnings that uh, I have read about, which I thought I would share with you. So a few things that we must keep in mind here are stick to the basics. A lot of people are doing digital for the sake of digital. In the end, it has to deliver on our PQC DSM matrix. It has to solve a business problem. So we cannot have a sexy looking plant with, uh, you know, which looks very cool, but in the end, our metrics are not being met. It, it cannot be a high cost plant or a low flexible plant, etc. So in the end, our return on digital investments uh, is important. It has to result in improvement of some of the basic parameters that are still very important. The second is clean up our, our IT stack. So if you look at our current SAP or Oracle or whatever ERP systems we have, we found in CIAT we had a lot of garbage in there. We had data of SKUs that we were making in the 60s and 70s. Each SKU had five, six codes all over the place. It was a mess. So you cannot have good data and AI coming out if you've not cleaned up your entire IT stack. The third we found is a lot about change management. So when you're talking about digital industry 4.0, uh, a lot of the leaders, people who have been doing manufacturing are mechanical engineers, electrical engineers with limited formal exposure into what's happening in this new world of digital. So we need to reskill the entire talent because 
there is bound to be initial resistance from many of these people. We also have to move to a culture of allowing experimentation and failure. But one thing I've also found is that when we look at digital, a lot of these digitals become, digital activities become random acts of digital. So we find a lot of digital stuff going on, people talking, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm working on this pilot, and this becomes a favorite word because everyone's working on pilots. And uh, there's this thing of you know, pilot purgatory or excess pilots happening, but we need to convert these pilots to scale up to make that difference. And we need to move from random acts of digital towards a more strategic digital thinking. The biggest possible change that we need to look at is towards training, re recruiting, and attracting talent. So I'd say the top management very often are older people who kind of not as much in touch with the digital world as maybe the 20 year olds. So we need to reskill even top management. And very often we don't have so much time to reskill everyone in the company. So you may have to look at acquiring talent. And as Mr. Bali said, partnerships, partnerships with universities, partnerships with startups, a acquisition of startups or investment, equity investments in startups to uh, develop that capability. And with all this, cybersecurity risks also come in. So as we move to digital, as we make our data so exposed to the outside world, uh, we must keep into mind cybersecurity as well. And finally, I'd say society and government have to be kept in mind as well. So it's the employment of people. I don't think digital is going to replace people. It will only augment uh, the kind and quality of work that they're doing. In India, we need to employ our own people, so it cannot replace for sure, and we have clear advantages of low-cost labor. So I don't think the investment in digital will justify replacement of people for quite some time. Even this time, the ruling party's manifesto spoke about Industry 4.0, which is quite amazing that they have Industry 4.0 in mind. So manufacturing over the last 50 years has changed so much. I'd say if you go back to the assembly line, it was the worst in terms of doing repetitive work. We, people were doing the same continuous work of the same task that was given to them. I'd say the next big shift was as we moved, uh, Toyota created their Toyota production system. There was more human creativity and involvement. If there was a defect, you could pull the end on, stop the work, and solve the problem. Continuous improvement and thinking was a part of daily way of working. With Industry 4.0 and auto, more automation, we are going one step forward. We will further reduce this stan standard transactional repetitive work and spend more time on value adding, creative, and thinking work. So to conclude, I'd like to reiterate that we are in this next big shift in manufacturing. The shifts that we will see will be tectonic. And those who are able to adapt to this change, reskill people, scale up their pilots well, and most importantly, I think stick to the basics will win. And these guys will win big. Thank you.